Steve, welcome. We have so much to talk about today, and I'm really excited about your recent reporting on the right-wing border insanity. It's sort of been lost in the news cycle, but it's, this is very important stuff. Um, so let's start with, let's take a look at your um, reporting that just came out in the uh, Texas Observer. Colin, can we put that up? Right-wing reps promote racist conspiracy theories in the border crisis. So there was a meeting by the GOP that was held on uh, the border crisis. They're basically talking about fentanyl being brought in by the Mexican cartel. They're using that as sort of a gateway to talk about limiting uh, you know, migration once again, you know, they want zero, zero migration, zero immigrants, not legally, not illegally, just zero. That's the end goal, right? I'd say actually maybe the end goal is to start deporting people as well. Uh, so Steve, talk, talk us through a little bit about your reporting. Sure. So after the House uh, became Republican in majority, we've been hearing a lot about uh, these ridiculous committee hearings of a variety of issues. And as you mentioned, one of them, which has been somewhat lost in the media, which maybe is ultimately a bit of a good thing, is uh, what they are describing as Biden's border crisis. Um, right. So uh, the one that I followed was part one. If they've had a part two, frankly, I've missed it. I, I don't saw think it's enough. happened yet. Yeah, I saw, <laughs> I saw enough. Um, and, and so what it really amounted to was... Uh, what I think anybody who's been paying to attention to right-wing rhetoric around immigration, it wouldn't be surprised by this. It was that, one, uh, the border is completely unsecure. Two, um, that a bunch of drugs are coming over and that it is illegal immigration and an insecure border that is actually responsible for it. And that this is why, you know, we need to basically crack down on a variety of forms of immigration and more or less get rid of asylum. I mean, that seems like what is the end goal here is to right. basically stop the flow. But right. um, during this discussion, at least from the Republican side, there's uh, very little mention of the context of like, what does this really look like over the past few right. years? Uh, yes, there are record breaking encounters at the border. Uh, but they don't really say much about why, what's driving that, or how we actually stack up compared to other countries. Um, you know, many people may not realize that, you know, we've seen only an 81% increase roughly, at least between 2019 and 2021, in encounters at the border and asylum seekers, whereas, you know, places like Costa Rica saw 368%, Mexico saw 559%, Colombia saw 914%. So, you know, we're not even facing the brunt of this. And yet, um, you know, Republicans want to cast this as just this, you know, invasion of yeah. criminals, uh, which, you know, we can get into why that's completely bogus in a second. But the stats just don't make don't any sense. Up. No, they don't. No, they up. don't. In fact, I have a video of a little clip that we put together of part of the meeting. Let's go ahead and play that. So um, folks can get a taste of that. That is the video from the hearing. Uh if we can put that up, Colin. Uh, so I was in McAllen a few years ago, and I was leaving at the airport, and there were people with the uh, manila envelopes getting on flights. Mm -hmm. um, they had just been processed, and the manila envelope is what is, is their uh, ultimate court date. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And how do they get on a plane if they don't have ID? How do they go through security? Um, that would be a question for ICRO, sir, because they make all those arrangements with the airlines. Okay, but, I mean, these individuals very likely do not have ID, but they're allowed to use their paperwork, their court date as their ID to get through security in McAllen. That's my understanding. They have certain documents with them, and they use those documents to get um, their travel uh, so documents. So whereas I have a federal, uh, I either have a driver's license or a military ID, that gets me through security, but these individuals who have just come into the country illegally requesting asylum are allowed to not show ID to get on planes. Is that right? I, I'm not aware of what they would do, sir. Okay, so um, Heritage Foundation's oversight project did a study of uh, illegal aliens that were released from DHS, cu uh, DHS custody. And just in January of 2022, they traced um, the individuals that were released to 431 separate congressional districts. Uh, you know, all but four congressional districts are receiving um, individuals th that have been processed from the southern border and are here illegally waiting uh, their hearing. I, I just find that to be 
pretty shocking. But um, again, I'm out of time. Thank you uh, so much for being here. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Shocking that people are waiting for their asylum hearing in states and that they came in legally with paperwork that he just doesn't like. I mean, this is the tone. So the reason I picked this clip, because it really sets the tone of where these guys are going, I think. Correct. Um, part of the narrative is that, you know, the federal government is trying to sneak people in through this asylum system and distribute right. them across the United States. And the allegation there being that Democrats are trying to basically, you know, rig the demographics in their favor, which is frankly, uh, an astonishing assumption um, that, you know, you don't think any of these folks are ever going to want to vote for you were yeah. that conspiracy <laughs> to even really be true. Right. Um, when w what it's really a representation of is that the federal government has a, a system for immigration and sort of management that extends all across the country. Right. Um, and states have taken part. I mean, we've had uh, even controversy about the quality of um, sort of, you know, housing for unaccompanied migrant youth in Dallas. It was pretty actually appalling. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they were smuggling these people here to permanently place them, you know, through this sort of backdoor system. Um, and then the reality is, yeah, most of the asylum seekers in the grand scheme of things are waiting in other countries. Right. Right. So I, it's just sort of the way they frame it. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Maxwell Frost, uh, because he was in this meeting and he gave a really fiery pushback against some of the uh, GOP talking points that were being flung around. So let's go ahead and play that clip. You know, it's unfortunate that this hearing started off with a ton of hyperbole and posturing, saying that President Biden and his administration have created the worst border crisis in American history. That isn't about oversight. It's about stoking the fears of immigrants and those seeking asylum. And it's something I take personally as a son of a Cuban refugee. Look, for, for many folks around the country who might only watch far-right media or just listen to even some of the folks on this committee, I, I'm curious, uh, Chief Chavez, when President Biden took office, did your agents stop enforcing the border and just allow everybody to come in, thus creating what we hear here is, is an open border? Did that happen when the president took office? Sir, thank you for your question. Uh, the answer is no, sir. Okay, We continue thank you. to enforce policy and laws. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, Chief Modlin, when President Biden took office, did the bo border just open and did you all stop enforcing your policies? Also, thank you for your question, sir. I, I can tell you this is the fifth administration I've worked for, starting with the Clinton administration, and Border Patrol agents do their job every day. Thank you. I appreciate it. Look, I mean, look, as y'all probably realize by now, a lot of these hearings are not really about solutions. They're about politics. And for me, I believe solutions must be rooted in facts. So very yeah he's like holding this whole thing to task which i thought was great that he was doing that i wanted to turn to tom tiffany of wisconsin because he was getting into this whole fentanyl argue, argument again right so it's about the fentanyl americans are dying of fentanyl is coming from mexico that but i that they haven't really made this connection for me that it's immigrants coming over these various border places not the not the legal ones where we know the cartels are smuggling from but all of these other migrants that are just fleeing from war-torn countries or from environmental issues, whatnot. Help me here. <laughs> well, uh, you know, one of the strategies that they've used to sort of build this narrative up is calling certain witnesses who will kind of do their bidding for them. Uh, I mentioned one of them in my piece who is a sheriff. Uh, he uh, happens to be affiliated with the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association, which if you don't know what that is, it's a fringe ideology and group that promotes this idea that sheriffs at the county level have this unique power to interpret the Constitution, um, which gives them this really convenient role uh, to play whenever you know they want to kind of push their ideology. Um, right. Basically, they say that, you know, they can arrest anybody who they want. Yeah, so, they're above the law, in, in my opinion. They think they're above they the law. They are the law. They are the law. There you go. <laughs> so, um, you know, this guy, uh, Donnell's is his last name, uh, Sheriff of Cochise County in Arizona. He gets brought up and they basically ask him, you know, if he agrees with the reports that increased fentanyl distribution isn't tied to the illegal border crossings. And he's like, no. 
the criminal cartels are exploiting the border. So it's always this, you know, vague statement. He just claims criminal cartels are exploiting the border, which, you know, to be clear, there probably are instances of cartels exploiting the border for reasons. But right. in the grand scheme of things, it is a red herring. It is yeah. not where the problem is really It's not where the fentanyl is coming from. Yeah. There's well, just... and, and to be clear, cartels are probably responsible also for bringing fentanyl in, you know, with American citizens help and through 100%. official yeah. court. But <laughs> yes. that is a different, that is a conflation of right. these issues. Right. That's exactly right. The, the migrants that are, that they're trying to like keep out aren't, they're two different separate uh, pools of individuals here. And you're right, they're making a conflation because they need to be able to make this argument to get it off the ground and to get the general public to buy into it. Um, so I want to talk about John Tanton for a second. Uh, John Tanton is an old school racist. He's no longer with us, but his legacy still is. He is the guy that started FAIR, which is not FAIR in reporting, but FAIR the immigration. Um, another another organization calls the USA Numbers. But he's basically, you know, a neo-Nazi, a eugenicist guy that wanted to. In fact, um, Colin, let's put up some of I have from I, I had done a piece on a, on John Tanton years back where I boy, got some FOIA requested documents from John Tanton. One of them was if we can put them up. Um, Colin, they were attached to the email. Yeah, there we go. So these are basically documents where he's basically saying, let's get rid of birthright. Um, you know, let's get rid of all immigration. Uh, you know, like here, this guy is saying, forget it. There's no way that's ever going to happen. You want to change the Constitution. But that's what he wanted to do, right? He wanted to change the Constitution to get rid of birthright. Um, anyway, uh, this guy is a, a real serious bigot and his tentacles are still with us. I know for, uh, for example, Trump had appointed at least nine different people, including, uh, Julia Kirshner, who was running the DHS for a while. They were all ex fair employees. So let's, let's see what fair posted about this on Twitter. This, I just wanted to give some background in information on John Tent for this to make sense to folks. So Fair says the fentanyl crisis is being driven by Biden, Biden's open border agenda, turning every town into a border town. Every town's a border town now. So um, can we pull that one up, uh, Colin? It's the video where Kathy uh, McMorris is speaking. Border crisis, the fentanyl crisis that's been driven by President Biden's open borders agenda. It's putting Americans all across this country at risk turning every town into a border town. More people than ever are dying from fentanyl poisoning. My, you know, most heart-wrenching is that fentanyl is an attack on the young generation. The number one leading cause for death for Americans between ages 18 and 45 is fentanyl poisonings. Last month, in my hometown of Spokane, Washington, law enforcement from Drug Enforcement Agency, DEA, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, and the Spokane Police Department seized 35 pounds of meth and 50,000 fake pills believed to be laced with fentanyl. It takes just one pill to kill. Okay, this is true, right? People are dying from fentanyl. A lot of people are dying from fentanyl. It's very dangerous. Uh, but that is because of the Sackler family, not because of migrants from Central America. I mean, am I crazy be, for saying that? <laughs> like, I yeah, you know, if if you didn't just wake up yesterday and have no history of the world accessible to you, you would understand that since 2006, right. Spokane County had you know, like not even just since 2006, but like they've had an opioid problem for a long time, and that started before fentanyl became the number one opioid that was distributed illicitly and you know was a cause of death there were other forms of illicit opioids that were destroying communities and so you know to to act as though you know this is just a suddenly new problem that has only existed under the Biden administration is disgustingly disingenuous yeah. and um you know it, it is a problem fentanyl it, smuggling a is a problem, problem yeah and but the mexican it, cartels are definitely dealing fentanyl um just to clarify that is absolutely true too but yes but this has a deeper history yes right. and you know we've we've failed to treat this as a right. public health issue for decades at this point um, right. So to, to lay it sort of at the responsibility, you know, the lay the responsibility at the feet of your political opponents is 
is a pretty ghoulish thing to do. It's ex incredibly ghoulish and disingenuous. Uh, so initially, Republican Representative Matt Getz of Florida, our favorite villain, proposed that each meeting begin with the pledge. In response, Democratic Representative David Cicilline of Rhode Island proposed an amendment that the pledge cannot be led by anyone who has supported an insurrection against the United States. Some Republicans oppose the amendment as unnecessary, saying it pol it politicized the pledge and that and then implied that that definitely the police was a comparably disqualifying un offense. OK, that was just this random thing. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like that was the beginning. of. But the it made hearing. me like, laugh before it all started. It, it was a, a shit show before it was a shit show. I mean, they basically wanted to insert the pledge as, you know, this. I, what I assume was a re representation of their patriotic, you know, love right. for the country or whatever. And they wanted to make sure that every hearing started with that. Um, and so, um, of course, there was some concern because in that proposal, there was no restriction on who could lead the pledge. Yeah. And, and also in trying to impose a restriction on it, I mean, let's be clear, like the leader of this committee, Jim Jordan, uh, was named as you know, sort of a pretty important individual by the select committee right. and, uh, you know, defied subpoenas. And yet here he is, you know, trying to subpoena people to come and answer him. So, <laughs> you know, uh, it's why I ended the article with the statement, yeah, the foxes are in the hen house. This whole thing <laughs> was uh, just a circus. Um, and it was very clear from the beginning. Right. And it doesn't seem like this is going to go anywhere productive. Probably not. Um, I want to broaden this conversation out a little bit more. There, you know, there are a couple of Telegram channels that are run by, I'm going to, I don't know what to call them, vigilantes. They're down at the border and they're acting as if they're vigilante militia groups. They're rounding up migrants when they see them. They're actually living in tents down there. They film it sometimes. Um, they have some sort of relationship with the border patrol because you see these guys in their videos that they post where they you know, are communicating with border patrol or they're calling them and letting them know that they found these individuals. Um, so Colin, can you play, um, if, do you have those handies? I sent, these are the two videos I sent in a separate email. If we could play the first one. I don't think Steve has seen these yet. I don't. Maybe you have. Are you in these Telegram rooms? Right, oh, no. Okay. There's there's so much <laughs> going on. I'm not surprised about this at all. Right. So, uh, but I want I want people to realize that this is deeper than just our Congress talking about this. Right. So the tentacles of this go from the Congress to the Border Patrol, you know, law enforcement to these vigilante right wing militias who are literally at the border policing it themselves. Uh, and they're being allowed to do that, you know, and they harass these individuals. No? no. Who are you calling? Well, you won't come over here. That's fine. You? Yes, come on. Up. Yes, come over here. You? I can't do nothing with you. You're over there. But this guy right here, how old are you? You got one more there, two more there? You stay? Any weapons? Do any, any weapons, knives, weapons, drugs? 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 Habla inglés. ¿Cuántos años aquí? ¿Cuántos años aquí? Huh? No, I, I look at your face. This is this is trafficking. How old is he? He's 20. How old's that? How old's that one over there? How old's he? Ask him how old the other kid is over there. He looks younger. You can cover your face, but we don't do child trafficking down here, buddy. You're lucky you're on that side of the border, my friend. Guatemala. Whoa. No. It's okay. Sit. And your little friend over there. I see you guys. No other. He says no women or children. No women or children. You got. How old are you? How old is he right there? Are you a child trafficker? Aren't you? You little punk. You're not allowed to do this no more. I'm not your. No, no, not your friend. Yeah, you better run and go back. Your shoes? Solo, him, get in the car. You, come on, come with me. They're not gonna be climbing over. You can you climb over me, perro. He, he, he'll, he'll bite you. He will tear you apart. So you try to climb over. You want me to leave him out and walk with you, the dog? 
You're going to drive up. Hey, you shut that drive up, and uh, BP will see me walking up with him. Immigration. They got a big camp over there, and there's a few more running in the background. No blind glass? No. Uh, that's, that's, that's a BM. Immigration? Just drive up to the port of entry. Go ahead. They they can't come. If they come, I I have to I have to turn them into. Too familiar? Too familiar? No. No familiar? Okay. God loves you. Dios? Do, do Dios? He loves you. God loves you. Okay? God bless you. You don't mean us no harm, and I know that, and I feel that. God bless you, okay? That other guy's bad. I don't know if you understand me, but I think you feel my heart. We'll turn this around. I'm not going to film the agents. Hand off. We don't film agents. Film eight. So, okay, wait. There's so much here to unpack, Steve, as I'm sure we don't film agents. He has no problem feeling the, uh, filming these individual faces that are trying to, you know, just seek out a better life. God knows what they're fleeing. But he won't film Border Patrol agents. And he's clearly working with the Border Patrol agents. So folks that are just coming in, this guy is not a cop. I know some people were wondering that in, in the comments. No, this guy is a vigilante. He's a right-wing militia guy that's down there at the border. There's a bunch of them down there. <clears throat> They've been staying at a camp down there. This is what they do all week. They harass people trying to get into the country. Yeah, this is a, this is a thing that's been happening for quite some time. There's a really great book I can recommend uh, by a journalist named Patrick Strickland if you're interested in learning more about sort of the history of this kind of stuff. Um, it's called The Marauders. Uh, it's all about, you know, sort of far right militias terrorizing people at the border. Um, and it involves like some really crazy stuff. I won't spoil it for you, but um, this is unfortunately kind of par for the course. Yeah. So this particular situation is in Arizona. I know it's happening in Texas as well. So how do you think there's a knowledge of this uh, with the politicians that are trying to push through this border crisis, immigration stuff in Congress? Do they, do they know that this is going on and they're fine with it? Because Border Patrol seems to be OK with it. So uh, I can't speak with like a ton of specifics, um, but I, I can say that there are politicians at various levels that have relationships um, of a variety of sorts, whether it's sort of handshaking in a photo or, you know, more friendly than that um, with these type of far right militias, because um, these groups tend to try to get the blessing of some sort of authority, whether it's like yeah. a sheriff or you know, ing ingratiating themselves with Border Patrol or some elected official at some DHS level. possibly, ICE, I don't know. But it's really appalling. This has been going on, though. You're right. So this this particular Telegram channel has been up and running for two years now. So for two years now, this, they have been engaging in these sorts of activities. I think it's being ramped up now. I want to mention one of the things that he kept saying. So we had the fentanyl thing, right? So it's the, the migrants are bringing fentanyl over the border. That was what this you know, uh, Biden's border crisis meeting was about with the GOP, right? This guy is claiming that he's trafficking children. Like he kept saying child trafficking. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of uh, sort of right wing militia type groups um, will have members that get it in their heads that there are these like pernicious, you know, QAnon type child trafficking schemes going on um, in the book that I mentioned, which actually takes place uh, most of it takes place, if not all of it, in Arizona. Um, okay. There were examples of these sorts of vigilantes, like, you know, throwing accu accusations that people were helping traffic people. 
Um, and, you know, that's not uncommon within the broader far right political sphere. Right. Um, the QAnon, whether it's QAnon or otherwise, it's become, um, you know, a hot button right. issue that people like to accuse others of. Uh, yeah. Not to say that there isn't human trafficking going on, um, right. but to immediately sort of jump to the conclusion without any sort of understanding. I mean, the guy couldn't even speak a lick of right. Spanish. Right. Um, it's it, it's telling to say the least exactly to me this is a guy that's probably looking for a better life you know and now he's being accused of being a human trafficker or bringing in fentanyl whatnot but this is this is the inevitable outcome of this ramped up rhetoric that we've been hearing in the country right over the last few years and i do believe that this is all just a mask for their racism right they don't want brown and black folks migrating to the United States. They want a white country. They believe white genocide is a thing. They believe white replacement theory is a thing. You mentioned earlier in the show that they believe that the Democratic Party is trying to change the demographics of the country because they believe that these folks will vote for Democrats and not Republicans. So they think that there's a, a, a vast conspiracy that goes along with that. Yeah. What, what happens next, Steve? I mean, it's just crazy. I don't know. I mean, unfortunately, in the situations involving these sorts of right wing militia groups, what ends up happening is like someone gets hurt and for no good reason. Yeah. Um, at least that's, you know, the case in the book that I've continued to reference throughout this. It's um, yeah, it ends up being um, a lawless sort of situation um, yeah. and and innocent people get caught up in it. Innocent people get caught up. Um, what parts of your article did, did we not highlight that you think are important before we move on to the next thing? You know, um, I mean, I think in the grand scheme of this, we need to understand that this isn't the first time this sort of rhetoric has been used, whether it was in the 1800s talking about Catholics or Chinese or Filipino immigrants. Right. There's been numerous examples of this like nativist rhetoric calling things an invasion um which you know typically comes from the perspective of a white anglo-saxon protestant mindset um so you know whether it's racism or white supremacism or nativism however you kind of want to package it it's um a strong strain of politics that's existed in our country for a long time and um runs really counter to like what makes our country good frankly I agree. I mean, we're whether people like it or not, we were founded on immigration. We could we could you know say we stole land. White people stole land from the uh, natives. That is absolutely the, tr the case. But I mean, let's not pretend that everybody here isn't from someplace else at some point, right? That's right. just you know. I mean, come on. Right. I agree with you there. Um. So we have had a really busy week <laughs> with right wing stuff this week. So. Um, I do, as you know, we do the right wing insanity roundup for the week. Um, I want to start off with this uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene clip because apparently she thinks Mitch O'Connell is a wait for it Democrat. How many people here and raise your hand if you if you believe that Mitch McConnell is a Republican? Raise your hand. Okay. How many people here? Raise your hand if you believe Mitch McConnell is a Democrat. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. How about that? Yeah. So Mitch McConnell, hey, he's, he, is, he is a rhino. He's worse than a rhino. He has helped, he has helped Joe Biden pass his agenda. <laughs> I mean... Mitch O'Connell is an incredibly conservative guy. I cannot believe that the Overton window has moved so far to the right that these individuals think he's a Democrat. Well, you know, as the saying goes, um, you know, I'm a proud member of the face-saving leopards party. <laughs> and I am certain, I am certain that my face isn't going to get eaten by leopards. Ex yeah, uh, exactly. There you go. <laughs> I thought about sums it up. All right. This next one is uh, Kennedy. I we, I always have to like make sure people know this. The John Kennedy from Louisiana. So let's let's clarify that John Kennedy. He believes that God made pipelines and he, they made them pipelines because they're safer than trucks and trains. Let's play this clip. What do you think of how the federal government has been handling this and, and should the secretary of transportation be out there talking to folks? Well, this is why God made pipelines. 
they're much safer than trucks or trains. Now, I understand this particular chemical uh, could, could not have been transported by a pipeline. Um, but, but all you can do is require the truckers and require the railroads to be as safe as they possibly can. But when you can, do it through a pipeline. <laughs> I want, I'm whatever. guessing that he has some pipeline donators. <laughs> I want whatever he's smoking in his pipeline. Like, <laughs> Jesus, man. Like, you went out of your fucking way to... Talk about how much you love pipelines. pipelines. Which had nothing to do with anything. Like, it was just the weirdest red herring, like, pipelines. He's like, I know they don't use these pipelines to move these chemicals, but I'm going to talk about pipelines anyway. <laughs> cool, man. <laughs> cool, man. All cool. right, the next one I have is just, I'm going to call him incel preacher. Uh, this is somebody that I was not familiar with until this week. His name is Jonathan Shelley. Um, and he has some nutty stuff to say about women and Antifa and um, what women should be doing as Antifa. The last thing we need is for more men to say like, oh, let's empower women. W what has that ever done for America? Are you going to tell me that America's gotten better in the last hundred years by empowering women? All these women judges... I mean, you really think the streets are safer now with all the women cops, women district attorneys, women judges, women governors? You know, that's destroying America. Yeah. And they're empowering Antifa. Yeah. And they're empowering all kinds of... They're gambling a billion dollars away yeah. is what they're doing. It's destroying America. And you know what? Getting sucked into this garbage. There are so many men today getting sucked into this garbage thinking they have to let a woman tell them what to do. You know, we need men to stand up and put women back where they belong in the kitchen. Back into the home, raising the family. Why? Because they're better at it than men. You know who's the best at raising children? Women. You know who's the best at cooking? Women. You know who's the best at being women? Women. Make women women again. I'm sick and tired of seeing all these women that are men. It's gross. And you know what? We need some real men. You know who's not good at being a man? Women. Just as bad as men being women, you know, is women being men. Hillary Clinton's not a good dude. <laughs> and this guy wonders why he can't get a date or all 20 of them in the room wonder why they can't get a date. I mean, this is some wild stuff. Yeah, yeah, F Freud would have a lot to say. <laughs> Freud would definitely have a lot to say. It's really wild, though. But women are empow empowering Antifa was my favorite line. I'm like... Okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll take the Antifa women back to the kitchen. Um, all right, our next guy is white nationalist Dalton Klobfelter, um, who also has some crazy misogynist, misogynistic sort of stuff that he said over the last week. Let's play that clip. Women have a purpose, and, and women, they need to be molded by the man, and they basically are, they're like, they need to be a blank slate when you meet them. They, 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 there's uh -huh, no political sure. opinion. There's no, favorite. there's nothing. It's and just natural instinct. Not even favorite music. Nope. No favorite music, nothing. They are a completely blank slate when you meet them, if, if you're looking for a wife. And then you, and then you give them that. You know, it, it's, it's me saying, I believe that the races are different. Oh, okay. I believe that Jews control the world. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. You know, it just, it needs to be like that. It, it's uh -huh. that type of relationship. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Women aren't even supposed to have their own taste in music. I mean, this is some wild stuff, right? I, I mean, like you can get like a Furby or a Tamagotchi if you just like <laughs> want like an input output relationship, but maybe even that's a little too complicated for this guy. It's a little too complicated for this guy. America, he's an America first guy. So for folks that don't know who he is, forget his name. I will never play him for you again. But I just was like, that's funny. Just looks like a very soft 
person, but yeah. let's go on. <laughs> let's move on. So this next clip, I think we have to play like a couple of times, Colin, because each time you look at it, you're going to want to look at a different person and their reaction. Let's go ahead and play that. If we couldn't begin with a threshold question, to wit, is President Biden woke? All right. My favorite personal one is the guy down in the front that goes, um, so this was the press conference at the White House press briefing. And so this guy says, with a straight face, to wit, is Biden woke? And he expected the rest of the press corps to basically be like, yeah, great question, dude. <laughs> I mean, like, what if someone, like, chased you around with a shovel? I, I don't know. That'd be crazy. <laughs> like, it's, next question, man. Exactly. <laughs> it's just completely wild stuff. Um, I do want to talk about also... So right now we basically have the uh, the Proud Boys are on trial. Enrique Tarrio, that, uh, their, their trial has been going on, I think it's in the fourth day now. But there was an interesting thing that came out um, today from the transcripts of the trial. Let's put this up. It's the Miami New Times, Colin. So who is the Miami crypto queen accused of devising the plan to overthrow the election? So if we remember back, there was a document that was uh, that was uh, shared by the Proud Boys. It was called the uh, 1776 Returns. And it was basically a, a map, a roadmap of how the insurrection was going to go. So apparently this originated with an ANCAP, I'm an anarcho-capitalist. These are extreme libertarians. They deal with crypto coin. They are anti-government, whatnot. Um, so I want to, can we pull this up, Colin? The Miami New Times? There we go. Thanks. All right. So she was once an obscure cryptocurrency promoter in Miami. Now she's at the heart of a national intrigue accused of providing a far-right group with a detailed plan to overturn a presidential election. Erica Gemma Flores is known in Miami's cryptocurrency circles as a venture capitalist and fierce advocate for digital currency. She founded the city's Bitcoin Center, a tech education hub in the downtown area, and supported Mayor Francis Suarez's efforts to prop the city up as the country's crypto capital. She has described herself as the godmother of the Miami crypto scene. God help us all. I, <laughs> I want to scroll down, though, to the messages. Um, one week before the January 6, 2021 insurrection, the report states that Flores provided then Proud Boys leader Enrique Tario with a document titled 1776 Returns, which outlined a plan to storm government buildings around the Capitol, including the House and Senate office buildings and the U.S. Supreme Court. The document is a core component of the seditious conspiracy charge for which Tario and other members of the Proud Boys are currently on trial in D.C. in the Washington, D.C. court. Text messages introduced as evidence in the trial show correspondence in which an Erica transmits the document to Tario around 12.50 p.m. on December 30th in 2020. Uh oh, hang on, I lost my place. All right. Uh, when describing the messages, wait, hang on. I think I skipped a spot. There we go. Text messages introduced. Uh, so transit 2020. Okay, if you don't like my plan, let me know. I will pitch elsewhere. One message to Tario reads, but I want you to be the executor and benefiter of my brilliance. <laughs> When describing the messages, federal prosecutors in the Tario trial have referenced the sender as Erica Flores, noting that she pleaded the Fifth Amendment and refused to answer questions about the 1776 returns document after receiving a subpoena, subpoena last year. She has not been charged in the case. Um, this is some wild stuff. One witness, prosecutors say, described Flores as a former girlfriend of Tario. Samuel Armez, president of the Florida Blockchain Business Association, testified before a congressional committee that he believed the 1776 returns plan was derived from a war gaming document that he had shared with Flores, whom he knew through the Florida cryptocurrency community. So basic, basically, she pilfered the plan from this other guy who was a gamer. And it was about war gaming. It wasn't supposed to be anything real, right? This is like some war game document. And then she decided she was going to turn it into an actual plan to, to commit capital insurrection, and she gave it to Enrique Tario. That's basically what's happening here. Have you been following this Proud Boy trial? Yeah, I, I read a bit about this earlier today, and I, there's a crypto fascist joke, but it's too on the nose, right? Like, geez, you could not have picked a better person to be thrown into the mix, someone who's deep into crypto coin. Because it's something that I think a lot of people have observed anecdotally uh, in terms of like uh, the affinity uh, in terms of the interest in crypto coin and stuff 
with some of these far right groups. Uh, right. Very, right, yeah. very funny turn of events. I thought so, too. Uh, so anarcho-capitalists, I want to talk about this group for a moment because you're right. This is something that doesn't get discussed a lot. There was that HBO documentary series that came out and they called it The Anarchist and everybody was kind of mm. like, yeah, I know, cringe, 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 because you expected to watch the show and, and see some sort of, you know, left version of, of what we would traditionally consider to be an anarchist. What we got instead was a deep dive into the ANCAP world, which is, these are anarcho-capitalists, right? So these these are very far-right libertarians. Um, you know, I would say that Peter Thiel is of this group. Uh, he's somebody that's advocated for seasteading. So if we seastead, if we seastead of corporations in the sea on these platforms, then we get out uh, up from under the wing of government, right? No government laws will apply because we're no longer part of the country. Um, so they have some very extreme positions. They are generally pretty anti-government positions. And these are traditionally not, you know, uh, things that people would put on the right, right? The far right. But it is definitely a growing group of folks and they do buy heavily into cryptocurrency. Yeah. And I mean, there's various flavors of this. And, you know, one tendency typically just thinks that the only thing the government should do is protect their private property. So it's like the state should only be cops, more or less. You're right, the state. And, and then like the judges that uh, rule on those sorts of cases and stuff. Um, so yeah, that's certainly not what most people would consider to be like what ideologically would normally be called right. anarchism or even libertarianism in other parts of the world um, because that word has become uh, right. changed and adopted by different folks in the United States. Right, right. You know, and so interesting stuff. And at one point, I think the article mentions that she was actually a delegate or related in some way to the Rand Paul um, run for president, which sort of fits. Um, yeah. Anyway, I thought this was an interesting because it wasn't something that I had expected to see this week. And no. it kind of was like, OK, here we have an ANCAP. ANCAPs aren't getting discussed very much. And maybe this is something that we should be paying more attention to. I don't know that they're dangerous, perhaps, but. Um, you know, the other part of the equation is that a lot of the sort of white nationalist neo-Nazi groups like crypto as well, because it allows them to engage in some of their um, things that they want to do behind closed doors that they don't want a paper trail on, right? Whether it's, you know, buying weapons, ghost guns, whatnot, uh, so things of that nature. So crypto is definitely, definitely has a, a, a part to play in right-wing extremist world, uh, that's not to say that everybody that likes crypto, uses crypto, whatever, is part of that. That's definitely not the case. But no. it's certainly part of this conversation um, with that. Uh, let's see. What is our next thing? I know I'd sent. Okay. So wanted to play. Uh, there we go. Another one on the uh, Proud Boys because, again, we're in Proud Boy trial. So this is on the AP AP article. So now we're going to, um, I love what I love about this trial is we're hearing about a lot of stuff that we didn't know about before. Um, it turns out that there was a, a police officer, shockingly, there was a police officer that was feeding information to Enrique Tario. <laughs> yeah. So that, this came out today too. <sighs> so a police officer frankly provided proud boys leader Enrique Tario with internal information about law enforcement operations in the weeks before other members of his far-right extremist group stormed the U.S. Capitol, according to message messages shown Wednesday at the trial of Tario and his four associates. A federal prosecutor prosecutor showed jurors a string of messages that Metropolitan Police uh, Lieutenant Shane Lamond and Tario privately exchanged in the run-up to the mob's attack of the Capitol on January 6. Lamond, an intelligence officer, wait for it, he's also an intelligence officer, for the city's police department was responsible for monitoring groups like the Proud Boys when they came to Washington for protests. Less than three weeks before the January 6th riot, Lamond warned Tario that the FBI and the U.S. Secret Service were all spun up, quote unquote, over talk on an InfoWars Internet show that the Proud, Boy, Proud Boys plan to dress up as supporters of President Joe Biden on the Democrats inauguration day. And if we remember back, he did, he did say this in his, um, I think can't remember now if it was his telegram room or what, but Tario did say dress up in plain clothes. Don't wear the yellow and black colors. We want to sort of look like we are blending in or we're Antifa. I think he said even in another one. So that is definitely the case. Um, 
Justice Department prosecutor Connor Mulrow asked a government witness, FBI Special Agent Peter Dubrowski, how common is it for law enforcement to disclose internal information in that fashion? I've never heard of it, Dubrowski said. Tario was arrested in Washington two days before the Capitol attack and charged with burning a Black Lives Matter banner taken from the historic black church during a protest in December of 2020. He was released from jail before the riot and wasn't in Washington on January 6th. So he wasn't in Washington because of that arrest. And he had been arrested, if we, if we recall, he had been arrested with two magazines um, and some other things in, a, in his backpack. So here we have a, a police officer with the Metropolitan Police Department basically sharing intelligence with Tario in the run-up to the Capitol insurrection. Doesn't seem good. <laughs> It doesn't seem good, and but I don't even think it's shocking either. Um, you know, no. there ha- there have been I know here in Los Angeles and uh, surrounded areas. I've had I'm looking at my board right now. There's two uh, Riverside Sheriff's Department guys that are Proud Boys member. There was Rick Rick Fitzgerald who was in the Fresno Police Department. He's a Proud Boy member. Uh, I know of one LASD, uh, one LAPD guy. So. Um, there's definitely infiltration of our law enforcement department by the Proud Boys. There probably still is. And not just the Proud Boys. A lot of folks forget that the Oath Keepers also, you know, came from law enforcement, right? That was started by the constitutional chefs, which you brought up earlier. The whole point was that they wanted people that were trained in law enforcement. So they went after those folks and also ex-military. Yeah, it's not a new phenomenon, to say the least, that um, there are white supremacist sympathizers or f- sort of far right sympathizers within law enforcement at various levels. Uh, I was on a panel uh, at all places uh, hosted by the Cato Institute, interestingly <laughs> enough. And um, uh, on that panel was a former FBI agent who had done some undercover work in white supremacist organizations. And Mike German? Yes, Mr. German, and he said... We've had him on the show. He's great. Yeah. He said, you know, there were things that he was told he really shouldn't talk about uh, with too many people and should very much limit the access to the information with people in the Bureau because there was, you know, sort of known sympathies and known elements in the Bureau that might, you know, have... So these would be other FBI agents that were had sympathies towards the right wing extremists. It cer- certainly yeah. sounded like that's what he was saying, wow. right? Um, and that it's been a known issue for a while, and wow. so um, that's you know not necessarily surprising. I mean, but he's also very much a straight shooter in the sense that yeah. he thinks that you know ideologically categorized surveillance is a bad thing, and that we should focus on a rather, you know, law enforcement should focus on uh, the focus on criminality, right? right? Like other people focus on ideology and the history and there's scholars and stuff you can look to, to understand that. But when it comes to the role of like the federal government, if they're, you know, doing surveillance of uh, an ideological group like white supremacists, yeah. they're probably also doing surveillance against like, Black Lives Matter groups, which yeah. there was that news yeah. that came out recently where that was exactly right. what was going on in Denver in a very not so good way. So no, it, um, it, they honeypotted these activists, which makes it even more unethical. It's yeah. not, not only did they have an informant that was telling them, they, this guy was literally honeypotting them and trying to egg them on into doing things. It's like, right. You know, really unethical. In, incitement or other forms of, you know, getting people to do things and showing yeah. up with the bag of goodies and planting an idea in their head. That's been a known right. problem at various forms of law enforcement for decades. And so, yeah, I don't think we should be surprised by this um no. but it's very good that it's coming out and it is, you know. it is good that it's coming out and it sort of makes sense that you know so the day i, I want to talk about the day of january 6th for a second here because we would see video from the day where there were some metropolitan police officers letting the insurrectionists in and saying yeah go ahead whatever meanwhile you had other officers that were getting killed more or less right i mean our historic footage that john farina uh, shot in that hall that officer's head was getting crushed in that door because they were, you know, spraying, they were bear macing and spraying like we, we don't have to rehash all of that, but you get the point. So there were some officers that were trying to like keep the insurrections, insurrections at bay. And there were others who were like, yeah, come on in. Welcome in, guys. Let me join you kind of thing. So I think um, 
sort of just gets to the heart of it is that no group is monolithic, right? So within even that's the case, even with the law enforcement, the unfortunate reality is, though, is that they don't tattle on their own, right? When they should a lot. Of, if you have a police officer that's committing a crime, that's even worse, in my opinion, that's even worse than a criminal committing a crime. You're supposed to be the law. You're supposed to be the good guy. You're supposed to be the gap stop to that. And if you're yeah. engaging, like, no, man, it's bad. Well, so, um, on that note, there's something that I wanted to bring up. I don't know if you saw it because it literally just came out in the past 53 minutes. But oh, Texas is a, yeah, Texas's attorney general, uh, Ken Paxton, who is, you know, our basically our top law enforcement official uh, in, in many respects, he um, has been indicted for a long time, right? And this yeah. trial has, you know, uh, which has not happened yet, has been, you know, rescheduled and pushed back so many times for various reasons. Well, 53 minutes ago, AP reported that Justice Department officials in Washington have taken over the corruption investigation <laughs> into Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, removing the case from the hands of the federal prosecutors in Texas who'd long been leading the probe. And this comes after Paxton's office settled with uh, a handful of whistleblowers in the office who had alleged various forms of corruption against him. And he settled with them for over $3 million, which now uh, the legislature of Texas has wow. to take up as a potential appropriation bill so that the taxpayer and the state would actually be the one that would be paying this out. Um, so, yeah, speaking of potentially, you know, people who are responsible for upholding the law, um, getting investigated for breaking the law and potentially getting their due, um, it's been a long time coming in Texas. And this would be a really, really interesting development. Well, yeah, I, I think we're starting to see mo things move in that direction and change, which is good. They're not changing fast enough. And I don't know that they will ever change enough you know, to put it mildly, but, but it's really been a problem for a long time. And it's what motivates a lot of the civil unrest run right now. And it's understandable why people are angry. You know, we were, I was down in Atlanta for cop city uh, a couple of weeks ago. And this is to me, this is just one more example. There was, you know, they're charging, uh, it's 18 now kids with domestic terrorism charges. And they're, none of these kids are domestic terrorists. Are you kidding me? You know, and I actually had talked to Mike German about this and, you know, Mike's thing was like, was the same thing he said. He said, no, it's, it's, they should not have these state laws because they're obviously too easy to politicize, which is what's happening. Mm -hmm. this, this is, this is, this is the state government trying to just squash the first amendment, trying to squash political dissent because, you know, 70% of the residents there about don't want cop city to be built. That's an overwhelming majority. Um, you know, one of the kids that I filmed uh, with Colin was just holding a banner and marching that night. He was not part of anything more than that. That is a protected First Amendment right. And yet he is right now at home with an ankle bracelet on his uh, on and he can't leave because he's facing domestic terrorism charges. It's it's at part of my French, but it's absolutely fucking insane. Yeah. Well, and there's a, you know, a long history of like white supremacist violence and stuff not being labeled domestic terrorism for exactly. very Exactly interesting reasons which actually i think are kind of important because if you you know start to cross lines where the fbi starts collecting a bunch of demographic data around a bunch of people and starts trying to categorize things as white supremacist domestic violence like some people may say that's an ex expedited way to solve a problem but you know others would say from a civil rights perspective that opens the door to all sorts of yeah. <clears throat> right. really bad things it's a slippery slope and right. suddenly you know what's being labeled what and how is that actually really right. shaking out, you know, most of this violence gets, um, you know, prosecuted, prosecuted in terms of like gangs. Right. Well, right. yeah, they get, they get, they get focused drug on as like dealing, gangs or other things like that. Exactly. So, right. you know, in this instance, it's, it's horrendous. And, you know, if there were actual, you know, property crimes that the local police or whatever were trying to investigate, I mean, like the reality is they're probably going to try to do that. And if they right. got charges on people, they might have a good chance of getting them. But that's right. a completely different scenario. That is a completely like, OK, pedestrian in a roadway, misdemeanor crime. Fine, whatever. I've got, you can go down the list of what those things are. But to say that these kids are domestic terrorists is just absolutely an insane <sighs> infringement on our First Amendment. It should not be happening. This law, it should not even be on the books. Yet it is. And you're right. So what a really important conversation to have, because I don't think people realize this. So the federal government doesn't have a domestic terrorism law. They do not have one. 
for this reason, right? Because it can be politicized. So like what Mike German would say is we have 52 other laws that we can use to charge a domestic terrorist and have him off the streets and not doing domestic terrorism, right? Whether it's gun charges, whether, you know, go down the host of things. Well, yeah, the, re the reality is anyone can go out and say despicable shit all they want. They can, you know, really say disgusting things and have horrible opinions. But as long as they don't commit violence or commit a crime, right. like the FBI or law enforcement has no role in investigating right. and surveilling them. That's just... Right. Like if they are witness to a crime and then they continue to be like witnesses to minor assaults at protests and stuff, then it might be appropriate for the to FBI to be like, yeah. well, why does this particular group have members <laughs> yeah, that right. continue to witness white right. supremacist violence? Like Adam Waffen division or whatnot. Exactly. Yeah, it's like may maybe there's maybe there's some interviews to be had there, at least exactly. for collecting information. But that's right. because it would be related to a specific crime. Right. Right. So. You know, we, we do live in a society and, you know, for better and for worse, there will always be criminal law and yeah. mechanisms for enforcing that. And, you know, the matter is, how do we do that in a more ethical way? And that's a I whole agree. other damn conversation. That is a whole for another day because it's, it's we're at the end of the hour and I know you have to jam. But I do want to ask you, you have a new uh, Protean magazine issue coming out. Uh, yes. What's in that? Uh, great question. So, yeah, we are nearly wrapping up the pre-order period for... Protean Magazine, which is a nonprofit literary magazine that I publish with uh, a group of people. Here is like one example of one we published. I just happen to have it. This is an Ellie Valley illustration on the cover. Ah, uh, yeah. Really, you know, high quality, like beautiful illustrations, uh, lots of good essays, fiction, poetry. And so this upcoming issue, sort of using this uh, metaphor of special relativity to examine you know a, a number of different things like people's you know uh, relationships to historical issues like the gravity the gravitational pull of history you know the yeah. all the sort of things that can uh kind of be discussed within this framework of you know this scientific breakthrough that taught us that so many things are relative and yeah. based on your perspective <laughs> in life and how fast or slow things are moving so um it should be a really beautiful um issue we recently revealed the cover and we've got all of the people that are contributing into it um on our fundraiser page which is on our main website if you're familiar with luke o'neill he's contributed some yeah. fiction to us right. um so we're really excited and uh if you order pre-order within like the next 10 days before the end of the month you can get cheaper you know, discount, basically you can get some special rewards okay, cool. and you'll, you'll know that, um, you'll be helping fund like a network of hundreds of artists and researchers and writers right. and poets who do really cool, uh, liberatory work and there are no advertisements. So, Which um, is even better. go check it out. All right yeah, on. Go check it out. So